This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 71st edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Today I'm joined by a special guest, John Lundeen. John is a Seattle attorney, a historian, and an author. John is an expert on the Northwest ski scene, and he's written a book about the subject matter. Before I go further with this interview with Mr. Lundeen, I want to recognize my engineer today, James Gerd. James is the host of the After Dark show at Rainier Avenue Radio. James does a lot of good things at the station. He's also a snowboarder himself, which is very fitting because we'll be having a discussion today about scheme and snowboarding. I want to mention we have a lot of good things going on at RainierAvenueRadio.world. We're based on the, on the World Wide Web in Seattle. Our sports department has shows hosted by yours truly. There's a show hosted by Rick Dupree, One on One with Dupe. Granville Emerson or Renault Laurent host a great show. Lidline Sports, Masvita Marari hosts Yellow Sports Weekly. Pat McCarthy, Masvita hosts a uh, show on the Seattle Metro Sports Conference. Uh, Mark Bryant hosts a fitness-based show. Juan Cotto and and uh, Mike Cobrezio host a show as well. I want to throw a couple of plugs to my Rainier Avenue Radio sports colleagues. My show, Sports and Stuff, has been around now for over two years. Having a lot of fun. Most of my interviews are now on. Mixcloud, and they're getting updated on the Rainier Avenue Radio website and my website. Let me go back to my guest today, John Lundeen. I've known John for many years. He, are you a retired attorney or attorney on sabbatical? How do you describe it, John? I, decide, I call myself an attorney on sabbatical. Love it. Love it. Attorney on sabbatical. John's had an interesting background in his professional <laughs> career. He worked uh, as an attorney before he entered private practice. John worked in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Department of Transportation as an attorney. He was a trial attorney for the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. I learned a few facts about you this week that I did not know. John was also an assistant U.S. attorney, and John specialized in private practice for many years uh, as a federal criminal defense attorney. Uh, John was also, I learned, a longtime legal counsel for the Seattle Audubon Society. So, John's had a had a, a very distinguished legal career, and John has also written a very good book about Northwest ski history entitled "Early Skiing on Snoqualmie Pass." Very good book. Uh, he's also published a book about wildflowers in Idaho, and he's writing some additional books. Um, and his book on early skiing on Snoqualmie Pass, I believe, first came out in 2017. John, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, um, he's a real Northwest ski history buff. He also has other uh, historical interests as well. John resides in Seattle in the Sun Valley, Idaho area. And you can learn more about John and his books and his works. I know I'm missing a few, but this is a preamble introduction by going to johnwlundin.com. John W L U D I N. And I also used to play basketball. John's uh, very nice son, Jason. Well, today, John, we're going to learn more about your uh, career a, a little bit and just a, a discussion heavily about uh, skiing and Northwest ski history. And I appreciate you coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio World. Glad to be here, Paul. John, skiing has been a big part of your life. And I know your, your mother, I believe, was a ski instructor. Why don't you share with us how you got the ski bug and what led you to your decision to write a book about Northwest skiing history? Sure. Just one clarification before we start. My wife was the one who wrote uh, History of uh, Wildflowers of Idaho, not me. She is the botanist in the family and the scientist. I stick to straight history. Well, I feel bad. I had a mistake, but thank you for clarifying. No I congratulate problem. your wife on that, on that book as well. Well, I'm a longtime skier. I learned when I was a kid. Uh, my Boy Scout troop got me into skiing. Uh, our scout leader... Uh, had a uh, access to a cabin on Snoqualmie Pass. He would take us up there on the weekends. We got a lot more snow in those days. We actually had to dig down to reach the second floor to get into the uh, the facility. And none of us had any money in those days. We uh, bought used ski equipment, and uh, uh, that's how I got my start. In those days, actually, you didn't really take uh, lessons you got a book. I remember getting a book, How to Ski, and practicing on my mother's living room, put on ski boots and skis, and they showed you how to fall down and get up and do a kick turn. So that's how we all got into the sports in those days. Learning by reading, different era. Yes. John, in your book, Early Skiing on Soqualmie Pass, which I finished this week, I read part of it about a year ago, and I finished it this week, in 1936, Ski Magazine described Washington State as the Switzerland of skiing, and the Seattle Times in 1935 
describe Snoqualmie Pass as where modern skiing was born and raised. Can you tell us a little bit about the influence the Pacific Northwest has had on the sport of skiing? Well, Paul, I was surprised to learn in researching this book the esteem in which Pacific Northwest skiing was held in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And there are some real reasons for that. Uh, Keep in mind that in the 20s and 30s, skiing was a fledging sport, alpine skiing. The predominant form of the sport in those days was Nordic skiing, which consisted of ski jumping and cross country. And again, to my surprise, ski jumping was by far the most popular form of the sport here in the Northwest, at least through the 1940s. Uh, We had national championship events here. We had a number of distance records set, and we would regularly have five to 10,000 people showing up in the mountains for these ski jumping events. However, in the early 1930s is when alpine skiing, or downhill skiing as we know it, first began to appear here. Initially, it started on Mount Rainier, and that attracted a lot of people from Tacoma. And Snoqualmie Pass started attracting people in the early 1930s. It was actually preceded by the Mountaineers who built their first lodge on Snoqualmie Pass in 1916. And they started really the sport of skiing on the pass. And a number of private families from Seattle actually started building, building homes or ski lodges on Snoqualmie Pass in 1931. And that's when the sport was really getting started in a small way. But several things happened the next few years that really made it a huge sport for the Northwest. Uh, One of the first things that happened was in 1934, the the result of President Roosevelt's uh, Make Work programs, the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Forest Service teamed up all over the country to support the fledgling ski industry. They built roads and trails, uh, cut uh, areas to ski in in the national forests, and built warming huts. And the first instance of their doing that here in Northwest was on Snoqualmie Pass. In 1934, they cut a narrow run right on the summit and built a warming hut. And that became the first open to the public ski area on Snoqualmie Pass. And interestingly enough, the Seattle Park Department took jurisdiction over it and ran it as a Seattle park from 1934 to 1940, even though it was 60 miles away from uh, the city. And it was such a phenomenon in those days that it was said that more people would come to watch the people ski than were actually skiing. But this really started the sport in the Northwest, and it got heavily advertised. A lot of history there, John, and your book goes into it. This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with uh, ski historian John Lundeen and author. As we speak now in 2020, John, would you say the Pacific Northwest is still known as a prominent ski area and a destination ski area for people, say, outside the Pacific Northwest? Well, it's certainly not a destination ski area. It's more of a local, regional, and day ski area. We don't really have destination resorts in the sense that that has become. Um, And uh, Northwest skiing, I think, plays second fiddle to the Rocky Mountains uh, these days. That's where most of the people perceive the best skiing. But uh, back in the 30s, that skiing didn't exist. And skiing all over the country was just local areas without ski lifts, I might had. In those days, you had to be physically fit enough to climb up the hills Isn't that something? before you skied down. Uh, what started uh, the whole concept of destination ski resorts was Sun Valley. Sun Valley was opened by the Union Pacific Railroad at the instance of Averill Harriman, its chairman of the board, in 1936 as a way to recreate passenger traffic that had been decimated by the Great Depression. So this was Harriman's idea to get a place for people to go on the train, and it worked. And he, he built Sun Valley in the middle of the mountains of Idaho, 
It opened in December 1931. It was built at a cost of $1.5 million, and it revolutionized the sport and introduced modern skiing to the United States. It had a big fancy lodge with high-end amenity uh, stores there. Um, Saks of Fifth Avenue ran the, the ski store. There were maids and butlers to cater to the rich people that came there. And that really created the the sport of, of skiing in the United States and the concept of a destination ski resort. And all the ski resorts that came later were more or less modeled on the Sun Valley concept. You know, I learned so much in this interview and reading your book. I, I did not know that Sun Valley was sort of the, the, the godfather, or the, the originator of the ski resort concept. John, you mentioned something that I found really interesting. I mentioned this to you before we started this interview, that Seattle at one time was the only municipality in the United States, I believe, to own a ski I don't know if you call it resort or ski facility. Ski area. Ski area. Yeah. The city of Seattle operates to call me at, at one time, which I think is just unbelievable. Here's my question for you, John. Do you feel this arrangement is something that could have worked long time with the correct structure? And do you ever envision a scenario of a city like Seattle going back into owning a, a ski resort or a ski area? They actually just operated. It was on public property, so they just operated the gotcha. uh, the facility. It's hard to imagine that would happen again. There are a few other instances where this has been done. Uh, Denver uh, operated the, and I still believe still operates, Winter Park in Colorado. And that may Didn't be the that. only other public municipally operated ski area in the country. And it's pretty much the haven of private investment these days. There's been a trend in the the ski industry for large corporations to gobble up all of the small ski areas and operate them on a for-profit basis. And that seems to be the trend for the future, and I can't imagine, with limited uh, possible exceptions, the public uh, investment in that uh, in the ski industry anymore. We have public golf courses, but ski resorts or ski mountains is a whole different animal, isn't it, John? It is, yes. John, you mentioned ski jumping, and, and that was certainly a a significant feature of your of your book, Early Skiing on Snoqualmie Pass. And gosh, when I read your book in the 1930s, there were just huge crowds watching ski jumpers up in western Washington. It, it's just incredible. I mean, one man it, did an exhibition jump of 294 feet. I mean, I just can't get over it. Tell us a little bit about the Norwegian influence on American ski jumping and just a few other insights you have about the ski jumping that went on back then. Well, the Scandinavians in general and Norwegians in particular, were responsible for skiing to be introduced into the United States in the late 1800s. And the Norwegians came over to this country as immigrants and settled the northern tier from New England through the Midwest to the Northwest. They are attracted both by the climate and the kinds of jobs that um, were offered here and throughout the northern tier. They brought their... Uh, Hometown, hometown sport of ski jumping with them. Many Norwegians learned to jump as kids, and that was a big part of their ethnic identity. And when they came here, they formed clubs and built ski hills to jump and introduced the sport to the, the country. And I will ask you this question, Paul. You may know the answer since you read my book. Do you know where and when the first ski jumping um, exhibition was was held in the state of Washington. This is a tough pop quiz. There, I know there was something about Queen Anne Hill. Do there I have that go. right? Do Nin I have it right? 1916, Queen Anne Hill was the first ski jumping exhibition in the country, in, in this part of the country. And it took place in the, the great, uh, what is now still called the great snow of the year. Uh, in February, they had, which is still a record snowfall in the city of Seattle, shut down the city completely, and the local Norwegians decided to show what their home country sport was like. They took Queen Anne Avenue, which is a very, very steep hill, one of the steepest in Seattle. It's incredible. Build a jump on the bottom, and thousands of people turned out for this, and it was a huge hit. And that really got the whole sport of ski jumping going here in the Northwest. Starting from that point on, the Norwegians organized 
Fourth of July ski jumping exhibitions on Mount Rainier that continued from 1917 to 1924. It was said to be the only place in the world beyond Finsa, Norway, where uh, ski jumping and skiing could take place in uh, in the summertime. Absolutely fascinating. And a whole group of uh, Norwegian-generated clubs began after that. Uh, the Cleone Ski Club was formed in 1921, focused around ski jumping. Uh, the Seattle Ski Club was formed in 1929, and they built a jump at a lodge on the Snoqualmie Summit. Leavenworth Winter Sports Club formed in 29 over in Leavenworth, and a Cascade Ski Club down on Mount Hood uh, formed in 1929. And they all built ski jumps. They all encouraged ski jumping. And there is basically a series of events, sometimes week from one week to another, where the same group of jumpers would go from one to another, and the same group of spectators would go to to watch them. It was a huge spectator sport activity out there, and I learned that in your book. John, I read in your book that ski jumping died off by about the 1970s, American ski jumping. Um, was Like we talked about, it was a big sports activity in the United States and Northwest at one time. Do you ever see ski jumping coming back in the U.S. as a popular sport? It's hard to imagine it would ever come back and and have the same esteem as it did. Keep in mind that there was no television in those days. Uh, the number of um, organized sports were few, and you had this fanatic group of Norwegians, of which I claim my heritage, uh, who loved their sport. And that was a certain time and place that made it important. Uh, it's still a very important uh, sport internationally. They have their own ski jumping organizations, and of course it's part of the Olympics. But uh, particularly with the, the rise of alpine or downhill skiing, I can't see ski jumping ever come back and, and uh, be held in the same esteem. It is a lot of fun to watch during the Winter Olympics. It's fun to watch. Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio dot World with James Gerd as my engineer today, and John Lindine, local author and attorney. We're having a great discussion about skiing. So, John, I I want to ask a question. I think this is a question James had before he arrived. And you're obviously a knowledgeable guy on skiing. You participate in skiing. You've written about skiing. Is snowboarding more respected among skiers now and in ski circles now? Very much so. It was very controversial when it first appeared. And uh, many, many ski areas wouldn't allow snowboarders initially in there. And the um, most skiers hated the concept of, of snowboarders coming in. Uh, in those days, it was largely dominated by young teenage boys who were kind of wild and crazy. And the, their whole ethic was inconsistent with most of the skiers. However, snowboarding and skiing have both matured a lot since then. And virtually every place in the country, every ski area, allows snowboarding now. And it's been the economic savior of the ski industry, frankly. Uh, the number of skiers per capita has declined significantly. And probably over the last 20 years, it's been the infusion of new people, new excitement, and new money from the snowboarders that have really kind of kept the whole winter sports industry alive. Isn't that something? It's sort of evolving like a lot of things in life. John, you wrote in your book about how back in the day, something else I learned, the Seattle School District offered free school ski lessons, like about 16 schools were involved. Um, here's my question about about that. Let me kind of take this into um, an extended topic Skiing is frequently perceived as a pretty Caucasian, upper middle class kind of sport. Do you, What are some ideas you have to get more people of color involved in skiing and people who are of lower means? Is, is school sponsorship one route to get more people involved? That's a great question, Paul, although very difficult to expand the sport these days. But keep in mind in the 1930s when these were happening, no one had any money. It was a Great Depression. Right. And um, skiing was very cheap in those days. You know, if you walked up the hill to ski down, it didn't cost you anything. And a lot of people used homemade equipment and regular clothes to ski in those days. So it was really a capital, non-intensive sport. 
And by the way, it it was the Seattle Times that paid for the ski lessons in those days, not the Seattle public schools. When the Milwaukee Railroad opened the Milwaukee Ski Bowl here in 1938 at Hayek, it was the first modern ski uh, area in the state of Washington. It was modeled after Sun Valley that had been opened two years before by Union Pacific. And they brought... Uh, their skiers up by train from Tacoma and Seattle. It was a two-hour train ride. They had a modern ski lodge, a J-bar, which is a, a form of overhead cable transportation up the hill. And um, they really introduced modern skiing into the state. And the Seattle Times, as well as Seattle PI, were great promoters of skiing in those days. Uh, the Seattle PI started uh, sponsoring the um, Silver Skis race on Mount Rainier in 1934 that became one of the most exciting and biggest ski events in the country. And in, in 1938, the Seattle Times paid for free ski lessons for uh, any Seattle public high school student. It was later uh, open to the Pretty private egalitarian in many ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very egalitarian. Yeah. And again, these were kids of the Depression. They had no money. Right. Uh, they would scrape together enough money to you know, take the train up, and they got free ski lessons. So very egalitarian. And um, because of that, each of most of the Seattle high schools formed ski clubs. And they would organize. They would have events against each other. Uh, and the Seattle Times, wanting to promote its free ski lessons, would give extensive coverage uh, all week, all winter, of what was happening up there. It was really remarkable how much skiing and skiing at the amateur beginning level was was covered by the Seattle newspapers in those days. So maybe something with the schools could be a way to get more different types of people involved in skiing It again. could be, and you see that in rural counties and rural areas where there's still – Small ski areas, kind of mom and pop operations that oftentimes only have a a, um, a rope tow. Uh, an example would be Loop Loop over in the Metal Valley, and there are a number of small areas in uh, Idaho and other places, and they basically serve small, um, not very affluent rural areas right. where kids could go and ski in the afternoon. But the skiing as we know it now. Um, is a very capital-intensive sport. Right. Uh, it costs $135 a day to ski at Sun Valley. And you can imagine the cost of taking a family of oh, four to of a money. place like that for a week. You're looking at $10,000 at least. So uh, most skiing has become a very affluent sport, and it raises some serious questions for the future of the sport, uh, which is already significantly challenged by global climate change that is forcing a number of ski areas out of business and has presents significant challenges as we go forward the next 20 years. You wrote about global warming in, in your book. Paul Steinman, again, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with uh, ski author John Lundeen. Well, we're, we only got a couple minutes left, John, and I, and I want you to have a chance to talk about a couple of subject matters that maybe we haven't got into yet. But real quickly, what's something you learned about the Northwest ski scene that you thought was really fascinating that hasn't come yet in our discussion today? Throw out like a tidbit, something that, that just, like, whoa, I didn't know that. Well, frankly, Paul, I, I had skied my whole life. My mother had skied her whole life, and I thought I knew everything about Northwest skiing. And probably at least 90% of what I put in the book was absolutely new for me. And we've touched on most of the themes. One, the predominance of ski jumping and the influence of the Norwegian community and how egalitarian it was back in the 20s and 30s and 40s when virtually no one had money, and yet this brand-new sport was exciting. It was promoted by both the railroads and the newspapers, and kids with really no athletic background and no money could get into it and have a terrific time. And a number of those kids came up through through that program uh, during World War II, went into the 10th Mountain Division and became mountain soldiers, otherwise known as ski soldiers, and later made their living through uh, the ski industry, uh, keeping up that love of the sport and love of the mountains after the war. So those are the kind of the things that really struck me. Great information. It's kind of ironic how, in some respects, 
it was more accessible during the Great Depression era than it is now for people. Absolutely. It's kind of a twist. Yeah. But. And when you have the main, the closest ski area run is the Seattle Park, it's pretty remarkable. we got, James, a couple minutes left? Well, About let, three minutes let left. me just say a couple things. Number yeah. one, I, um, I was one of the founding members of the Washington State Ski and History, Ski and Snowboard Museum on Snoqualmie Pass. It started about five years ago. Right. And I wrote this book for the museum, and all the profits from the book go to support the museum. Right. So anyone who's interested in seeing a fascinating glimpse of our history with over 100 historic pictures, you can rest assured that the proceeds from your purchase will go to support a great institution. And I'd urge everyone to check out at least our website, which is uh, wssm.org, or just Google Washington State uh, Ski Museum. And we have a, a very illustrative website. It's a great program. It covers the full range of the history of Washington skiing. Kind of the center core exhibit is of the Washington Olympians, of which we've had 39 and uh, we've won 15 medals. So it's really remarkable. One name that came up, John, who I thought was very interesting, is Gretchen Frazier, the first American to win any medals, the Winter Olympics? Any, any ski medals. Any ski medals, right. Yeah. She was a Tacoma product, uh, learned to ski in Mount Rainier, and refined her uh, skiing at Sun Valley. And in 1948 at San Moritz, won a gold and a silver. And that traumatized the rest of the world because – U.S. skiers weren't supposed to win Olympic medals. That was a great story. But it shows how uh, the significance of Washington skiing. In 1936, we had the tryouts for the 36th Olympics here on Mount Rainier, and five Northwest skiers uh, were on the team. Uh, There are three Northwest skiers on the 48 team. So that showed how competitive Northwest skiers were in a very competitive world in those days. John, we've got like 15 seconds left. Throw out uh, a little about your future and some of your other works you're well, working on. Well, I will. I've written two new books. They'll be published this summer. They're both about Sun Valley. One is the definitive history of the Sun Valley Ski Resort called Skiing Sun Valley, a history from Union Pacific through the Holdings. The second is uh, a um, history through pictures book. It'll be called Sun Valley, Ketchum, and the Wood River Valley. Those will both be produced or come out uh this summer sometime. Look forward to reading them, John. Thank you so much for coming on Sports and Stuff. Thanks, Paul. I enjoyed it.